Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you so much for spending your Saturday here with us. I, uh, my name is Corey Vignola. I'm one of the Climate Resilient Program Coordinators here with Deliax, and I am here today with Lori Caldwell. I will give a more formal introduction in just a little bit. Um, and today we're doing a little bit of a different experiment, doing a hybrid slash in-person event. Um, there's a lot of environmental factors taking place. Um, and so thank you so much for tuning in today um, and just giving this a try to see how hybrid works. Um, a little bit about today is we're gonna be talking about backyard composting. Lori has a really wonderful uh, presentation that uh, she's prepared for us. But before we get too deep into that, I just wanna give a brief introduction about uh, Deliax and what we're, what we're all about and what the work that we're doing. Um, one thing I want to know is that we're here at the Petaluma Library. Uh, we do have one of our model sites in the back. We are in the children's garden at the front of the library, which is managed by the master gardeners. Um, sorry, excuse me, Sonoma County Master Gardeners. So we're very thankful to be able to be here today and host our, our workshop for you all. Um, and of course we have uh, Lori, the composting gal. We have her logo and the library and ours in the city of Petaluma. Great. So a little bit about Daily Acts is we, that we are a environmental um, education nonprofit where our mission is to inspire transformative action that create connected, equitable, and climate resilient communities. Uh, we do this through a three-pronged approach, one um, by spreading solutions and models. So much of like what we're doing today by coming out to the community, doing workshops to help empower people to grow their own food, their own medicine, um, and to connect with their community. We are also, also involved with uh, various coalitions things through our Leadership Institute um, and our Eco to School. And our third one is that we are involved within political will. Um, so for the last 25 years, we have been working to empower people to be the change that they want to see, to create a rippling effect. Um, and today we're joined with Lori, who's gonna be giving us um, a wonderful presentation um, just some minor things is uh, if you throughout the webinar, if you have any questions, we welcome them. There are no silly questions. I know this morning I was looking at Lori's bin and asking a bunch of them and getting really curious. Um, and Lori is very educated and informed and loves questions as well. Absolutely. So we'll, <laughs> we'll give the presentation, but if questions arise, um, we will have a portion towards the end of the, the workshop. Um, but we will also be able to answer them if a few people have them that are repeating themselves. Um, this workshop is also recorded. So if any reason you have to hop on out, that's totally okay. We'll send a follow-up email at the end of our workshop in the upcoming days where you'll be able to see the recording and also see all the amazing resources that Lori and us have prepared for you. Without any further ado, I just want to introduce you to Lori. Lori is an, an um, Alameda County Master Composter and Bay Area um, friendly certified landscape professional, self-taught edible gardener and sheet mulcher. Uh, and they're going to be here today to tell us about composting. They have their business, The Composting Gal. They work with Stop Waste and we are truly just so appreciative and thankful for them to be joining us. Um, so without any further ado, I will pass the baton to Lori. Please bear with us is that there are a lot of ongoing, <laughs> a lot of ongoing elements such as a cow in the background. I hope you all can hear me and thanks for giving this a try. This is really our first hybrid event. So thank you so much for being with us and just supporting Daily Acts. Welcome everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. I'm generally pretty loud anyway. But I'm not sure how I'm, how I'm going to do up against a cow. So that's going to be a first time for me because I normally or I'm up against uh, planes and um, planes and trains for noise. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Composting 101. Today we're going to be focusing on what is known as basic compost. Uh, also, I'm going to be definitely touching on things like worm compost as well. So welcome. Welcome, everyone. I'm Lori. Um, I'm going to be your instructor today, and we're going to talk about compost. So do you have any questions about compost or composting in general before we get going? Why isn't it easier? Why isn't it easier? Okay. Well, I think, well, 
Well, well, I will definitely, definitely touch base with that for sure. For sure. Like I said, we're going to be covering basic and worm. Um, for some reason, you folks don't have opportunity to see my flip chart. My apologies. I will be including a PowerPoint um, for a follow up email for that. So it's going to have all my notes um, and, you know, pretty pictures and stuff into it. So our agenda for today is as follows. We're going to talk about why compost, the benefits of composting, as well as using compost, two different key but important things. Welcome. We're going to talk about setting up your bin, um, building a pile, uh, and then the opportunity about what goes in and what stays out of your compost bin. Um, I'm going to be breaking this up. The first section is going to be on basic composting, and then the second little section is going to be on worm composting. So if you still have questions about worms, please enter them into the chat, um, and I can answer them when we get definitely get to the worm section. We're going to talk about troubleshooting your bin how to harvest, when do you know when it's ready and how to use it. And then of course, there's gonna be a great opportunity at the end um, to ask questions. All right. The many benefits of composting and using compost um, are as follows. Um, it's gonna build healthy soil. Healthy soil is extremely key to any type of gardening. So if, whether you're growing natives or you're growing food crops or you're just doing annual flowers, building healthy soil is the key to any successful gardening. And compost is one of those major keys uh, to make that thing available. So it's gonna retain water in the soil longer. And of course, here in California, um, we have a water issue. So maximizing the, 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 the use of water in your soil maximizing the, um, reducing the need to water a lot more often. Um, that's where compost comes into play. It's gonna hold on to soil, water in the soil, definitely a lot longer than definitely without. If you have clay soil, compost is gonna open up that clay soil and make it a lot easier for water to percolate through it, for roots to penetrate down through it. Um, if you're me and you live near the water, chances are you're probably gonna have sandy soil. Sandy soil has its own issues, but using a compost and other soil building techniques, you're gonna clump those sandy particles together um, so your soil can hold on to water and nutrition, definitely a lot longer for sure. Uh, let's see, balancing the moisture and temperature in the soil is also key. Um, if your soil ends up going through periods of time where it's going to be wet and then dry or hot and then cold, Compost is gonna keep everything on an even keel. And that way there's no fluctuating temperatures. There's no fluctuating moisture levels. Those types of scenarios are prime for pests to come in because it stresses out your plants. And then that's when a pest is gonna come and want to prey upon your already weak uh, plants. And then it also feeds the soil food web. Right underneath this feed, underneath this lovely mulch, that I'm standing on is a whole other ecology, a whole other ecosystem going on where it's roots and bacteria and fungus and all different types of invertebrates and um, microorganisms and macroorganisms all working together. When you feed the soil and you don't give it toxic substances, that soil returns its love by protecting, uh, protecting us from pests and killing diseases in the soil. So building healthy soil is probably the most key component to any garden, no matter what you happen to be growing. It's super important. You're able to close the loop right there in your garden or on your urban farm or in your community garden or wherever happen, you happen to be composting. You close the loop, you grow the crops, you grow the flowers, you take whatever's left over in the waste, you compost it, and then you cycle it all the way through and return that finished compost right back onto your garden. There's no trucks involved. There's no greenhouse gas emissions involved with closing that loop right there on your property and it's super key. Um, the use of compost is also gonna help with reducing erosion. Um, the best example I could possibly use is here in California, when we have a wildfire season, our wildfire season usually proceeds usually a big rain event. And after the big rain event, we always end up with mudslides because there's no 
organic material any longer in the soil. And now that soil gets taken away um, by the water because there's nothing to hold on to it. By incorporating the use of, hello, the use of compost in it, you're keeping the soil. The water is going to pass through the soil as opposed to slipping underneath it and taking it and taking it away. And then of course it saves you money. The best compost is the compost that you make yourself. You know what exactly what you've been feeding it. You know how long it's been, you know, cooking um, in your yard. You know exactly when it's ready and you can harvest it whenever it's ready. Generally, um, I have a three by three by three system and I generally generate anywhere from about 25 to 30 gallons of compost a year out of my little bit, out of my, my bin, which is ample enough for me um, for my little garden for sure. Any questions about benefits? All right. So the next question is, and the question I always get, what do I have to compost? What do you have? Do you have a, a large yard with a lot of trees? Are you still rocking a lawn that maybe you don't put a, you don't put any chemicals in? Um, do you have a lot of fresh and you know dried prunings that you can utilize? If maybe you just have yard waste, you can do composting. We could do them in a no fuss pile, which is just a pile, and we'll talk about the recipe um, in the next you know little flips there. And or no fuss pile, or you can do chicken wire, or you know some sort of gauge wire to kind of create kind of an open pile or a bin doesn't require a lid, especially if it's just yard waste. It still has to be that good combination of the things we generally for composting, browns and greens. And I'll definitely get into that as we um, as we move further into the into the talk. But say you have uh, yard waste, the same amount of stuff. You've got a lot of dry leaves, fresh prunings. Maybe you have some herbivore manure. Maybe you're rocking a bunny or a guinea pig at your house. Um, but you want to also incorporate food scraps into it. So if you're going to incorporate food scraps, you're definitely going to want something that's rodent resistant. You can make a bin rodent resistant, or you can buy it already that way. And definitely something with a lid is going to be definitely key. Any kind of covering, regardless, is always key, especially once we get into the rainy season. Here's hoping. And then maybe you don't have any yard waste at all. Maybe you live in an apartment or your yard has no trees. There's no kind of brown dried things that you can get from it. Um, then worm composting, a worm bin um, might be the way to go for you as well. So it really all depends on what kind of materials that you have. But you can be successful either way. Let's talk about that bin, right? It's all about the location, 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 location. If at all possible, your compost bin is going to want to be in the shade versus being in the full sun. Um, mine, uh, my only option is full sun, but that's just how my yard is, which is fine. But I always have to constantly maintaining it, making sure that it doesn't dry out. That's one common thing. Um, so one of the misnomers about composting is the fact that the heat that's generated in a compost pile, when they talk about hot composting, the idea that it's being generated by the ambient temperatures or the fact that my compost bin is, is black plastic or, but it has nothing to do with it. It all takes place in the center of the pile where your food scraps most likely or your herbivore manure are kind of resting. It becomes food for bacteria. That bacteria start to eat it they eat it and they start to multiply and the rubbing of their bodies together is what generates the general heat in the dead center in the middle of the pile. So putting it in the shade is gonna keep the moisture level pretty even. Um, of course, you're gonna want to add water on a pretty consistent basis for your pile. Um, I usually have to add a little bit more water than normal because my bin's out in full sun. So we'll, ha we'll have a tendency to dry out a little bit quicker than most. I said, talked about making it rodent resistant. Um, the one quarter inch kind of mesh is a great option for that. I always tell people to I take it like a coffee filter. You're gonna lower it inside so it lines the bottom and hopefully partially the sides of your compost bin. That way, if anything's gonna try to get into it, that thing is gonna try to crawl underneath, dig underneath the soil 
and try to come up. But if there's nothing for them to get a hold of, this is going to definitely help protect it. Um, and I wouldn't use chicken wire because um, rats and mice can still get through. It's half inch. They can still get in through it. So a quarter inch is going to be a good option. You'll find a quarter inch um, hardware wire works um, on several different applications in any type of gardening situation. Um, having it lid, lidded or covered, whether by via tarp, again, you don't want it to rain on it to either get it too saturated, then you have to correct it, or get too wet and it end up leaching out all the good stuff that you need. You want to keep it moist, but not too saturated. But I have been known on a good rainy day to go out and take the lid off my compost bin and let it rain down on it. And then, you know, unfortunately, it's never that much rain. Um, and then I can correct it with that some of the tools we'll talk about today. And then placing, if you have a bin that's supposed to be placed on top of the ground, then please place it on top of the ground. I know there are tumbler situations that don't actually touch the soil. I do love the idea of it being on the soil if at all possible, just for the fact that where it touches the soil, there's a whole host and you're connecting to that ecology that I talked about briefly. So worms are going to come up and they're going to grab food and they're going to do whatever they're going to do. And then they're going to go back down into the soil and they're going to come back up and down. And so it's nice that you give those compost critters access um, to that. I'm putting it on like a cement type of thing is most likely going to dry it out a lot quicker just because that cement holds a lot of heat. And then you just want the really, really quick, easy access for your um, organisms and for your compost critters to come up and help you do, you know, help you do the work. The nice thing about it is too, and the question I always get about putting things like citrus in a compost pile, I'm fully, totally for it. I wouldn't put it in my worm bin just because my worms don't really have an opportunity to escape. They have some holes, but it becomes more problematic. In a basic bin, they're able to go down into the, back into the soil and allow for the citrus to kind of decompose so it becomes a lot less of a threat and then once it takes care of that then they definitely return and eat whatever's left which is nice so definitely place that on the soil welcome everyone we do have handouts on the table um if you're just joining us via zoom um the handouts will be sent um along with a powerpoint presentation of this um, after the um, after the talk all right and please feel free to um, jump in with questions if you have questions. All right. Our basic compost recipe um, is browns and greens, air, water, and some thyme, and then compost. And I'll definitely go break that down um, in some further, uh, further flips. We're doing 50-50 by visual inspection. This was talking about actually building the pile when you're building the pile. So if I say I have, you know, four inches of browns, I'm gonna put four inches of greens on top, four inches of browns on top of that. It gets this perfect kind of ratio on um, where we wanna balance things like carbon and nitrogen, carbon being the dry, you know, crackly stuff, um, the nitrogen being the stuff that's fresh and wet, new stuff. You want a good combination of that in order to break that down. There are a lot of caveats to that. And I'll talk about that when we talk about pile building. Um, just for the fact it really all depends on what your feedstocks are, how much water they're holding, that type of stuff. Water, I want it to be damp as a wrung out sponge. So if I just go to my compost pile and I grab a hold of it, I put my hand in it, which I, I'm known to do. I will, I want it to, if I grab a handful of that compost and squeeze it, I just want a couple of drops to come out. I don't want it just coming straight down my arm. If it comes down in rivulets, it's definitely too wet. I want it to be damp. It's just enough to feed the organisms and provide enough moisture um, for, your, for your pile. Aerate, don't turn. Now, of course, you're more than welcome to turn if you have space for turning, if you have the time to turn. Um, but the ultimate goal is always going to be to try to aerate, try to incorporate a lot more oxygen into your compost, into your compost pile for a variety of different reasons. If I'm building a compost pile, all my stuff is going to be wet at one point of time. And wet stuff has a tendency to get, of course, heavy, and then heavy stuff becomes compaction. So if I have my compost pile, eventually over time, all that heavy and wet stuff 
is just going to close off pore spaces. And now decomposition is pretty much slowed down. But if I can just add some air into it and open it up, then I can get oxygen in as many layers as I can. And that's going to help keep decomposition really rocking and rolling for sure, which is super important. So by aerating, I mean basically just, you know, take a pitchfork, take a digging fork, take a piece of rebar. Um, I had a coworker tell me some, uh, the other day that somebody used an old poker, um, poker, fireplace poker, to just kind of stab it because it has that little kind of hook. So it kind of pokes it, it's sharp enough to poke through, but it kind of brings stuff up a little bit. What the idea being too, you want to aerate it, especially I like to aerate it for ease of harvesting because the idea being is I'm going to build my pile. I'm going to add to it, but all my finished compost is eventually going to sift down to the bottom of the pile. And so when it comes time to harvest, all I have to do is dismantle my bin, take the unharvested stuff, and then just move that to the bottom. And then it's pretty much like a good third, almost two thirds of my bin is just compost that maybe just needs a light sifting. You just take out some big chunks, you know, you know, pits and stuff like that. But if I'm constantly aerating and if I'm trying to mix the new, the, uh, the old stuff in with the new stuff in my pile, when the time comes to harvest, now I have to harvest the whole bin. And I really don't want to do that. It just makes it that much easier for me to be able to have access to it, give it a light sift, and then I'm really good to go. And then time. That's the question I get all the time. How long is it going to take for me to get a finished product? How long is it going to take for me to get basic compost? And the answer to the question is, it really all depends on the composter. If you're out there pretty consistently, you're aerating it, you're watering it, you're feeding it, you're doing all the little things that we're going to talk about when you do pie building and maintaining it, then it's going to go a lot faster. But say you just build a big pile and then you don't do anything with it. It's going to compost. It's just going to go at a much slower rate. So we always say that compost happens because it does, regardless if you build a pile and totally ignore it um, or you build a pile and you're constantly maintaining it, it's going to become compost. It's really about the composter and how quickly do you want to finish product. So let's get into it. You heard me talk about browns and greens. So let's talk about what are the, some of the really key things that you can put in, a, um, in your compost pile. So browns, high in carbon, talked about that earlier. Anything that's kind of dried or woody. So branches and twigs, uh, um, dried leaves are also really great. Things like chip, uh, chip wood, even things like sawdust, any kind of wood that's definitely untreated, we definitely want untreated wood um, to go in. Hello, welcome. Oh, no worries. No problem, compost happens. <laughs> uh, chip wood, pine needles, with the caveat that because they're evergreen, they have that little waxy cuticle on the outside. You don't want to make sure you want to break them up so the bacteria and fungus have an opportunity. You give them an in pretty much so they can help break that down. Um, I like to do dryer lint and all cotton loads or wool loads if I'm drying wool. Um, and then sometimes in a pinch, um, cardboard or newspaper can be used. But my biggest tip for being really, really successful in composting is now that we're approaching fall, I mean, you really can't tell because it's, you know, we've, this week has just been relentless, but eventually we'll get there and all the leaves will start to drop. I go around and I collect as many as I possibly can and I store those to the side because come summertime, you know, you're going to have a lot of fresh and really wet things, you know, a lot of melons, a lot of strawberries, a lot of stuff. And you want to maintain that balance in the bin. Browns are key. That they're there. They help maintain that balance in the bin. Too many browns, then decomposition slows down. But if you have the right amount, decomposition can go really, really well for you. With, when you use cardboard and newspaper, I kind of like them to like, they're not like leaves. They're not like twigs and branches. They're like the, the Pringles of browns. You know what I mean? They've been shredded up small and just kind of like preformed. So they do have a tendency to mat a little bit quicker, 
than a lot a lot of things. So just be mindful if you have to use that in a pinch that you're going to have to kind of aerate it a little bit more often because that compaction is going to be a lot quicker. Um, I've been really implementing things like cardboard egg cartons in my basic bin, also in my worm bin, generally because newspaper is kind of at a at a premium these days. Um, and I'll just put them in like this. Again, it's kind of mimicking that kind of cup shape. And so there's going to be these pockets of air. So I like to use a cardboard egg carton um, as often as I can. Any questions about the browns? I like to indicate straw, not hay. Hay is the stuff with the seeds in it. All right, so now we're going to go to our greens. So greens, high in nitrogen, generally very fresh, very wet. They're the ones that hold all the moisture. So we're talking about grass clippings from untreated lawns. If you treat your lawn with any kind of chemical, I don't recommend that you incorporate that into your compost pile just because those chemicals are not going to compost. They're not going to compost out. And quite the opposite, if you add them in regular, they're going to bioaccumulate. So remember that everything that you're going to put into your compost pile, it's going to be composted, but eventually is going to end up in your garden. So you want to be careful what you definitely put in there. That's why the no treated wood type of thing. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought there was a question. My pardon. So uh, fruit and vegetable peelings, you know, apple cores, skins, just as a heads up, avocado skins, like, like they never break down. Um, corn cobs, they never break down. You just find yourself, the, but don't be, mis uh, the avocado skins look like you just put a piece of leather in there. It just looks like a, so just as a heads up. Um, Eggshells take forever to break down, but I like that. I like to have my, my compost, you know, have eggshells in it, it's calcium. So it's gonna be eventually leached out into the soil, which is another key little mineral that really doesn't exist, very kind of high in the soil, very low, low, like trees can get to it, but my tomatoes can't get to it. Tea leaves, um, you can put tea bags in there. Just be mindful, they're kind of switching up tea bags these days. They're making more of a plastic option as opposed to a paper option. You'll know when you compost it and then the leaves get composted, but the, the entire tea bag is still, the bag itself is still there. Coffee grounds, including the paper filter, you can incorporate that. Eggshells, those are great. Herbivore manures. So if you have access to chickens, which actually aren't herbivores, are actually omnivores, chicken, um, chicken manure is a composter's best friend. So if you have chickens, you know somebody who, do, who does have chickens, yeah, then definitely. It's very, very high in nitrogen. So if you're looking to break down large quantities, lots, lots of wood, stuff like that, chicken manure, adding chicken manure is really going to help. It's going to really pump up the temperature as far as killing weed seeds and everything. Yeah, you had a question? Rabbit, yeah, it's not as high in nitrogen as chicken. But yeah, you can definitely incorporate rabbit. There's guinea pig. Um, there's debates on whether or not to add things like cow or horse manure. That really comes down to like things like dewormers and antibiotics. So if it's something that you, somebody you know who has their own horse or you have your own host horse and you know, you know when things are going on. Um, but yeah, all those herbivore manures. And then hair, fur, and feathers. I always put my hair in there and fully breaks down. Um, you know, you're brushing the cat or you're brushing the dog. Uh, and then if you happen to open chickens, feathers do really, really well. All kind of fresh and green. Don't be dismayed by the color. So coffee grounds, they're brown in color, but they're very high in nitrogen. So they're technically a, they're technically a green. Um, if you um, incorporate things that are fresh and fresh, like evergreen leaves, like maybe pine needles, or say you have like coast live oak, um, those would be green even after they turn brown. So grass clippings and like evergreen leaves, for specifically in my own purpose, like coast live oak, even when they turn brown, they still have a significant amount of nitrogen in them. So why they may be brown, I'm still going to treat them like a green accordingly. All right. Any other questions about browns versus greens? 
Yeah, absolutely. All right. So fried greens are brown, but the same green they're green. They'd be considered a green. So fresh pruning. So if you're pruning things as long as it's not diseased. So say, you know, you're pruning back your, you know, maybe you're pruning your citrus tree. You know, it's just it's getting crazy and you so much fruit. Um, those we consider the green for sure. It's still fresh, it's still wet. Once it dries out, then it becomes, it definitely becomes suitable to become a brown. All right. So we know what goes in. All right. So let's start with pile building. So I'm gonna take my bin, I'm gonna put it in the shade, if at all possible. I'm gonna, I'm this bin, I'm gonna add uh, food scraps to it. So I'm gonna make it rodent resistant. If it already ha doesn't have a base, I'm gonna, you know, give you some quarter inch mesh, line that on the bottom, make sure it has a lid, and then it's gonna be time for me to set it up. So I'm gonna start with a brown, something that's, um, this is a great opportunity for things like sticks and twigs or bigger chunks how big of a pile you want to get and sky's the limit pretty much it really all depends on if it's something that you can maintain on your own um usually anything that's a cubic yard or larger is considered a hot pile anything that's smaller than that's considered a cold pile and we'll definitely talk about that too um in between the slides so start with the brown layer so i'm going to put my chunky wood or my branches or my big sticks on the bottom it's going to be great because this is that stuff that's you're most likely going to have to sift out of your finished compost because it's going to take a long time. But in the meantime, it's going to hold space for air underneath there, which is, you know, as I said earlier, is super key to making sure that decomposition. So if you have a fair amount of like a little air pocket on the bottom, that means that air is always going to be constantly there, which is, which is super important. So I'm going to start with the brown. I'm going to layer equal portions of the greens on top. Again, if I say I do four inches of browns, I'm gonna pour four inches of greens, but notice I put a little star next to it. It really all depends on what your greens are. So say I have a friend who brews beer and I get all of his brewery waste. So the brewery waste itself is going to be, it's gonna be a green, it's fresh and wet. It's going to be very, very heavy and hold a lot of water. So I need to really kind of compensate for that during this period. So either say I do four inches of browns, I'm gonna do the brewery yeast or the brewery waste. Say I decide I wanna do four inches of that. Now I have to make sure I have plenty, plenty of wood that goes on top of it. Or I might just do a two inch layer just because it holds and just do more, introduce more thinner layers of the brewery um, waste than I would normally. So it really all depends on what you're looking at. If I'm thinking about using chicken manure or guinea pig manure, um, when you get it, it's not just the urine and the feces. You're also incorporating some bedding with that as well. So I'm getting my greens, which is the, the actual manure, and then I'm getting some browns, which is the actual, which is the actual carbon. So you kind of have to play with it a little bit, just taking into consideration what you're adding and what needs to compensate for it. Does that make sense? Did that, did I explain that all right? I always want to make sure that the balance stays even. And you can correct it relatively easy, which is nice. I'm going to water the layers in, especially as I'm building it. So each layer, it's just gonna get a really good soaking of water and I'm gonna build that pile. I'm gonna aerate it with a fork um, during that period of time, just cause I still want, I don't want it to start off completely compact. I want it to be a little bit on the fluffier side. So as I'm layering it, I'm going to be aerating it at the same time. And then I'm gonna to top the bin with a final brown. So every time I go to look inside the compost pile, I should see a brown. So I'm gonna start with a brown and I'm gonna finish a brown and all my good stuff is gonna be layered in there. And of course, depending on how much stuff that you have, depends on whether or not you're gonna be doing um, what's known as either hot pile or cold pile. Any questions about pile building? Do we get any questions in the chat? Okay, let's set those up. Thank you. 
February. Mm -hmm. mm. So we have a few people uh, asking questions about rodents. So one is asking, how do you maintain a compost with a hungry rat population? Okay. And then another person also asks, uh, how do you do a ground system without attracting rodents? Because um, they have a rodent problem there as well. Sure. So when it comes to rodents, again, you know, making the bin rodent resistant is key. Um, possibly building your own bin might be key too. I mean, I guess rats don't really have a particular preference of wood over plastic. Um, but like I said, lining it with the quarter inch is going to be super key. Making sure that it's on the bottom is key. Also making sure that you bury the greens in the middle of the pile. So if I'm, you know, I'm leaving for the day, I have my little container that's supposed to go into my compost pile and I just go, I take the lid and I do what we call dump and run. I just dump it right on top. And then I leave and I put the lid back on. You know, there's fruit flies that could potentially be a problem as well as all that food is now exposed. You're gonna wanna pull back those browns so you see some greens, bury them in the middle of the pile and then cover it over. Um, there's also something to be said about um, creating like uh, using bungee cords or putting something heavy on the lid in order to kind of keep them out for sure. If it's just a question of things like food scraps and food scraps being the attractant to it, then you may want to consider maybe doing like a more of a no fuss pile where it's mostly just yard waste and, um, you know, dried leaves, fresh leaves, you know, pine needles you know, manures, stuff like that. And maybe take your food scraps and incorporate it to a, excuse me, into a worm bin situation and then do that in an enclosed area like a garage or I keep mine in my living room um, or your living room, depending on where you want to. So yeah, those probably would be my best recommendations. And then of course, also deterrence, you know, uh, chili powders, uh, peppermints. Um, there's a lot of things you can utilize to put around the bin to make the bin itself as a deterrent. And also, come on, all these ideas. Also, just maintain your bin on a constant level. If they think this is a place where they can just come and chill and eat the food that you give them, um, they're going to want to hang out. They're going to want to raise their young there, and you don't, definitely want to avoid that. So maintain your bin pretty consistently, letting them know that this is not a place for you to hang out is going to be also key as well. Hopefully, that answered everyone's question. Yeah. You want to keep going? I yeah, can say yeah, something. yeah, one more, please, sure. Uh, are compost bins supposed to smell or do they smell? They should not smell. If they do smell, there's a couple of things at play. Either you you, you dumped and run, um, you put something in there that's not supposed to go in there. We're about to go over that um, in a little bit. Uh, or the bin is too wet. There's not enough browns. Um, and the bin is either too many too many too many greens and too much water, mm -hmm. but it's not supposed to smell at all. If it smells, then there's definitely something amiss. But the nice thing about it is it can be easily corrected for sure. And we'll definitely talk about that in the troubleshooting. Sure, awesome. I'll see the rest for after. Do you mind passing this around? Sorry for those the zoom. This compost. I brought some from home. I encourage you to give it a sniff. Compost is supposed to smell kind of sweet, kind of earthy, you know, because it's not much different than when you go for a hike and you pull back all that leaf litter and it's that sweet smell underneath of compost. All right. So now I've built my pile and now I'm going to, I'm going to want to maintain it. Of course, chopping things up into smaller pieces is also going to be key. Again, it's going to give the opportunity for uh, more exposure, more cut areas, means that bacteria and fungus are going to be able to get have access to that because they're the first line when it comes to compost. The bacteria and the fungus, a lot of our compost creators like roly poly, they're there shredding down things into smaller pieces, making it accessible for things with no teeth or smaller mouth parts in order for them to ingest it. And then they pass that through their system and enriching our existing compost, which is nice. Increases that surface area. And then you don't have to go hardcore when it comes to chopping. I mean, I understand we're all busy. 
you know, stuff happens, you know, but it's always nice, especially if you're preparing whatever the cuttings are, you know, if you're just, you know, orange peels, you know, cut it up a couple of times and then throw that in the mixing it again, aerating it often. That should be kind of your regular, you know, every time you're out there to maintain it, I always make sure I aerate it. I always make sure I give it some water. If, if even if I'm not feeding it, because I have to, I have my worm bin to feed and I have uh, another bin to feed and then I'm always taking in my greens. Um, but it's like this to teach classes and stuff. So maintaining watering again, damp is a wrong out sponge. Um, you'll find that when it comes to watering it, um, everything, it compacts, but everything's usually kind of tight. So you think you've watered it, but maybe the water only gets like that, that much lower. So usually I like to give it a good poke, kind of create some channels and then give it a good water, good watering. Sometimes I will just stick it right in the middle and I'll wait to see water kind of come to the bottom and I know it's made it to the bottom. Because you'll be surprised. You will be very surprised to see how quickly it doesn't um, make it to the bottom. I talked about adding the greens to the middle pile again. I lift my lid. I'm always going to want to see a brown on top. And then again, don't dump it wrong. Now, when it comes to, depending on the composter, you can be the type of composter who just builds a hot pile and then just leaves it. Or if you are because maybe you, that's just how you want to do it the, with the amount of materials that you have, you know, you go out of town or whatever. Um, some people in the most of us we're called constant adders. So we're constantly be going to be adding material pretty much on a consistent basis to our compost pile. So that's why dumping and running is definitely um, not the way to go. All right. So when you're building a pile, we talk about hot pile versus cold pile. Now this is a hot pile only exists because of the, the amount of materials that you're having in order to create this pile. Anything that I can create that's going to be a cubic yard or larger, if I have the materials to do that in, which is awesome, um, it's going to be considered a hot pile. But eventually that pile is going to become cold. Now I can build a cold pile because I don't have as much stuff to make a cubic yard worth of stuff. And there's a lot of benefits to cold piles for certain. But at some point in time, my cold pile will eventually become hot depending on what I add to it. So when we talk about hot pile versus cold pile, it's pretty much at the time that you are building it. What size? What amount of feed socks do you have in order to make um, either one of those piles? So yeah, because each one's going to go through a cold phase, each one of them is going to go through a hot phase. So hot pile. So again, I'm going to build it. I can expect if I layered correctly, if I've watered correctly, I can expect the temperature to rise relatively quickly quickly in my compost pile. Last for about three to four days. Um, probably shrink my pile by a good third and then it'll go through a cooling off phase. Thermophilic bacteria are the reason. Remember those bacteria I talked about in the middle pile that are mating and starting to go. So they usually range up to about 120, in some places 130 degrees. So it's faster decomposition, which is great. Um, definitely those hot temperatures, of course. Um, if you are incorporating weeds, um, if you're able to get the temperatures that high, that's where weed seeds do have opportunity to get killed off. So. Usually if I'm thinking I want to create a hot pile or I want to create a hot pile situation in my bin, that's where I kind of like take that fresh chicken manure and I set that aside. And then I incorporate things that I really want to kill off, mix it with the chicken manure in the pile and then get those temperatures for the sheet. So then now the pile will go down probably lower than hundred degrees. And then it'll just kind of be maintained. And the bacteria responsible for that are the mesophilic bacteria. They're your kind of like, I call them nanny bacteria. They're the ones that just pretty much run the day-to-day, -day, the day-to-day -day in your compost pot. And again, with the addition of any more greens, um, especially really high nitrogen greens, your pile is probably gonna get hot and then go back to be cold again. 
for cold piles, again, if I just have a little bit of stuff, as long as I can measure out that recipe, that 50-50 by visual inspection, I can make a compost pile of any kind of size that I want. Again, it's going to be cold, so it's not going to get to that hot temperature, but worms are going to come. They're going to love it. They're going to come and they're going to hang out. Then with all the other compost critters are going to break that down. And then they're going to really enrich that compost with this stuff, which is worm castings, which is super key, very high in nitrogen, um, super nutritious in the soil as well. So you end up getting a lot of worms. A lot of people say cold pile compost or even worm casting compost are great for defeating things like wilts and soils. And they're also responsible for um, killing a lot of um, uh, diseases in the soil as well. So they're great benefits, but it really all depends on how you start. A lot of stuff, not so much a lot of stuff, but you can be successful either way, I guarantee it. So we talked about what goes in. Now let's talk about sage. Talked about a couple of these briefly. One of them, which being um, treated wood, of course. So no pallets, no you know Duraflame logs or any residue that comes along with that. No furniture, you know, glue furniture, stuff like that. Um, no feces from dogs, cats, or tropical birds because you're dealing with things like E. coli or toxoplasmosis. You definitely want to try to avoid those. Um, I'm giving you a basic recipe. So that basic recipe also does not include things like meat or dairy or cooked foods. Um, that's definitely going to attract things like rodents. That's definitely going to attract things like fly maggots and there's nothing grosser. All the other compost critters are so easily to handle, but fly maggots, not so much. You definitely don't want, you want to avoid that for sure. Things like anything that has oil or grease on it, that includes things like salad dressings, stuff like that. A lot of our compost critters, they breathe through their skin. So oil and grease on that is gonna potentially suffocate them. We definitely wanna to try to avoid that. Noxious weeds, especially if your home compost system does not get up to those high temperatures to kill those things off. Basically adding noxious weeds, when I talk about things like vinca or bindweed or Bermuda grass or ivy or any kind of, you know, fur clove or any kind of really, really invasive noxious weed, you definitely want to not want to incorporate that because now those weed seeds have gone in there and then now they're, when you spread the compost, it's like fresh weed seeds, food for weed seeds now that they're composted and now you're just basically spreading that weed all over your yard which you're, I know you're doing your best to control it. Any kind of toxic substances for sure. One of my first gigs as a uh, kind of composter as I answered a composting helpline in Alameda County for about a year. It was fun. Um, a lady had called because she saw a bunch of bugs in her compost pile and she sprayed it with rain. And so she wanted to know, what does she do now? And I, unfortunately, I had to tell her, you have to get, not only does all this stuff have to go, but now it all has to go to the landfill. Bugs are key. We definitely need them. And sometimes you see things like slugs and snails, whatever, ants. They could be obnoxious, but they're just there for the free food and water, to be honest. But the, basically, a lot of our compost critters are there to work really, really hard. And they're really, really key. I mean, the worms can't, I mean, the worms can do it by themselves, but they definitely need, plus you're most likely killing off all the fungus and bacteria as well. So you just basically just napalming the whole, the whole lot of it. So definitely avoid toxic substance. Glossy paper, like coupons, magazines, if you need to use paper, um, I would use something that's, you know, like regular newspaper, like I said, egg, um, cartons. And then of course, disease plants. Those would be well bet to go ahead and put those in your um, in your green bin, your organic cart. They're gonna get temperatures a lot hotter. Again, also a lot of these things can be introduced into your organic cart because when it does go and it gets made into compost, they shred it up very, very small. The temperatures are like 150 degrees. So it's killing up all those pathogens as well as the weed seeds as well. So yeah, go ahead and you know volunteer that, but save all the good stuff for your home compost. You know, 
we're passing these new laws, it's going to be a lot more compost that's accessible to the homeowners, to the urban farmers, to the community gardens. But again, the best compost really is the compost that you make yourself. And there's a fair amount of pride that comes with that, if I'm being honest. I mean, anybody else composting? Do we have any other composters here? I mean, there is a fair amount of pride that comes with it. You're like, I made that. I made that for, you know what I mean? I had this meal. I took the scraps from, you know, the fruits and vegetables or the things that I made or the things that I baked or I made jam or I did some juicing. And then that all goes into the system and gets recycled back and goes right back in those plants that I got that original food from. So it's, there's really something to say about that for me personally. All right. So let's get to the troubleshooting part because for those who are currently composting, this is usually um, this is usually for you guys. Smelly, we talked about that briefly. Compost is not supposed to smell. So it's either too wet, um, you have the wrong greens in it, or you have a lot of exposed kind of green material. Um, you don't want it to be smelly. If it's smelly, there's something that's amiss. So if it's too wet, I'm gonna add some brown material with it. I'm definitely gonna aerate it, top it with some browns. If it's the wrong greens to so say, you know, someone put a pork chop in my compost pile, I'm gonna take that pork chop out and then I'm gonna aerate it and then I'm gonna top it with some more browns to kind of bury any kind of potential like residue that's there. That's for smelling. Same could be said for fruit flies. And you know, if you have fruit flies, because as soon as you pop that lid, you're going to get inundated. So either your bin again is too wet or the greens haven't been buried in the pile. So you have a couple options. Of course, if it's too wet, I'm going to, of course, incorporate a little bit more browns and I'm going to aerate it. Um, if it's a lot of fruit flies, I'm going to take and I'm going to fill my, my bin all the way to the top with browns. Fruit flies like to mate in midair, but if there's no midair for them to mate, then you basically stop that life cycle from, um, from continuing on. So that's where fruit flies. So say I built my pile, I think I built a hot pile, three by three, I thought I got my 50-50 good, I thought I had enough water, I thought I aerated, I come back three days later expecting it to shrink by a third and it hasn't shrunk by a third, it looks exactly the way that it did when I first built it. So obviously decomposition may have stalled. So that could be a, one of potential two many things too many browns, <clears throat> not enough greens, not enough water. And I would usually, I'm usually going to assume in a lot of ways that it's probably a lot of browns. So I'm going to add some more water. I'm probably going to add some more greens. I'm going to go ahead and aerate it. And then I'm going to see what happens. The decomposition is still kind of stalled. I might add some additional water. For me personally, as a composter, for me, it's a lot easier to make my bin a little bit too wet and pull it back than to keep just going a little bit at a time to see where the tipping point is. I'm going to go full bore and then ask for forgiveness by trying to bring it back and to add some more material and to um, some more brown material and kind of aerate it. That's the reason why I like to leave my the lid off of my bin on rainy days. Well, why not? I'll just go and, and just rectify this. All right, bounce greens and greens. Okay. Oh, bugs, I'm sorry. I wonder what this was. We talked about that. Definitely important for the process. Definitely important for it. Super key. And then unwanted guests. We touched briefly that on things like rats and mice, but of course there's also like raccoons because there's going to be a fair amount of worms in your bin. So like bungee cords or your friends or cinder blocks or anything that you can use to kind of either weigh, weigh down the lid. They're not so much the diggers that you think, um, but they're mostly like rip the lid off and just kind of just go into your bin. So trying to keep them out is going to be super key as well. All right. So now you've done all this. You've aerated it, you've watered it, you're spending a lot of good time with it, and it's time to go ahead and harvest it. So how do I know whether or not it's ready to harvest? What do you guys think? How do I know it's ready? Is there a little button that pops or any indication? 
It's a rich story. Exactly. It looks like nice and rich. Whatever I put in there, the apple core, that broccoli stem. Um, that's not true. I don't pop those broccoli stems. I don't eat my broccoli stems. But if it's whatever I put in there, I don't recognize, and then I know it's ready. That's also key to not turning your bin. Um, that way I can push back all the stuff that I know is not ready to go and access the stuff that is ready to go. So I'm going to remove it from the bin. I'm going to sift it. Again, <clears throat> I made a, uh, a sifter out of quarter inch mesh. Just I keep it over like a 30 gallon garbage can and I just shake it. It's really good for the laps and for the triceps. Um, and then I sift it. And then I'm going to take it and I'm just going to put it, if I'm not going to use it right away, which I can, because um, I think mine's been resting long enough. But if you'd like to cure it, if you don't think it's quite ready or you're not quite ready to use it, take it, put it on a piece of soil, just give it a little bit of water, and then just cover it with a tarp and leave it, you know, anywhere from about two to three months or any kind of period. This is called curing. This is the last option to any last little organic material that can come out of here um, is going to. It's going to get this kind of a swan song. It's last little opportunity because it's not mixed up in the whole, the whole ecology of your bin where it's mixing with old and new. This is just compost as it is and any little last, last shout out for any kind of compost critters to come and um, step up to the plate, they can go ahead and do that. And then you can use it. But I've used mine right from the bin as well. It really all depends on your timing. Sometimes there's timing or sometimes your bin is full, but for some reason your friend's like, I have, you know, 20 pounds of brewery waste. Or and you're like, wow, well, my bin's not prepared for that. Let me harvest it. And then I can go ahead and, um, and build a new pot. So I have it, how am I going to use it? So say right now we're just about in the process of transitioning from spring to fall. So I'm going to take all my old plants out. And then before I go to put my new plants in, I'm going to put about a couple of inches of compost right on top of the soil. I might kind of scrunch it in with my fingers. I'm not going to use like a um, like a fork or definitely not a rotor tiller. Uh, because when I water it, all that organic material is going to filter down into the soil. Or the worms in the soil are going to go food and they're going to come up and then they're gonna bring it down into the soil. So you really don't have to use a lot of work. And if you're in my situation where you have sandy soil, that compost is gonna slow the percolation of water um, into the soil as well. It's gonna make it go a lot, a lot slower. And so it's gonna hold on to it a lot longer. So about one to two inches, if you grow things in containers, I use the same thing. If I'm starting a new container, it's all just gonna to get top dressed with um, some great basic compost. Now, especially since I do grow a lot of things in containers and as you know, the temperatures have a tendency to get hot, I definitely wanna maximize my water holding capabilities in my container um, or even in the ground. I'm going to side dress with compost. Prior to like right before I got really hot, I was like, okay, I need to protect my plants. It's been a while since they had compost. I'm gonna put compost already around my existing plants and then I'm gonna water that in as well. Again, it's gonna increase the water holding capability of the soil. Um, it's gonna provide some, some basic nutrition. When you're talking about the, um, the nutrition in compost, it's, it's pretty even. If I'm talking about the NPK number, it's the ratio of nitrogen, phosphorus to potassium. You usually see that ratio number on like soil amendments. For compost, it's one to one to one. So we call it kind of the great leveler. It provides equal balance, but just a little bit of nutrition, but really its magic comes with its ability to break up the soil, clump the soil and hold onto water a lot longer. Plus there's the option of holding carbon into the soil. Another reason to avoid tilling. When you till, all that carbon gets released into the atmosphere. When you add compost and you use compost in your soil, carbon is actually being pulled from the atmosphere and put into the soil it becomes carbohydrates and becomes food for our wonderful ecology in the soil. So using compost um, is going to do a really, really helpful job, at least for us on a larger scale, especially if everyone starts to use it um, when it comes to global climate change, because if you can take it and capture it and make the soil a huge sink for it, um, it's going to be really beneficial to us. 
Then there's compost tea, and that's a whole other process. Um, very successful, it usually involves brewing um, with water and compost together, um, aerating it for about 24 hours, and then using it to just drench your um, soil at the root level. Also, a lot of people like to put it as a foliar spray and to spray to help control pests and to provide nutrition for the plants, and they just absorb it for the holes in there in the leaves as well. But it's a definitely a much longer process, but it should still be considered and um, can be fun. And then say I'm going to, I'm gonna plant a tree. So I'm going to mix some soil in it. I'm gonna take my parent soil out of that hole. I'm gonna take three parts of that soil. I'm gonna mix it with one part compost. And then I'm gonna return the tree back into the hole. And then I'm going to backfill. I'm gonna take that finished soil and I'm gonna incorporate that and mix it into the soil. I'm generally not a big proponent of digging a hole in the bottom and then putting compost on the bottom because then the roots have no reason to go anywhere. If I'm spreading it out, then all those little tiny root hairs that go for food and water are gonna be attracted to that and they're gonna to wanna to spread out laterally as well as vertically. All right. Do we have any questions in the chat before we, uh, we move on to worm composting? Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Yeah. For the fire truck. Yeah, absolutely. It was a question about comparing compost to mulch. So compost can be considered a mulch. It doesn't have as much as the, the a lot of the effects of like a chunky mulch is. Um, but since it, it's laid on top of the soil. It could be considered that could be considered a mulch for sure. But if you're looking for like wood chips like we have here, I think the, the use of both together is super key for a variety of different reasons. The mulch is going to team up with compost for that water holding capability much lot longer. Um, while the compost will probably fade a lot quicker, the mulch was going to be there to back up, and then eventually that's going to decompose. Um, and work its way into the soil as well. So yeah, mulch can, compost can be considered a mulch, um, but yeah, we trade it more like a soil amendment. So you can use them both ways, but I wouldn't use it just alone. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If I'm gonna use mulch, I'm gonna definitely use mulch just because it's gonna hold onto water a lot longer. What made me think of the question was that the two inch. Oh yeah, on the top. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things going around with, um, things that used to be composted, they're called overs. Usually there's the big chunky stuff that usually would just get reintroduced, but they've already been kind of composted. So they have, there's a lot of microbial activity on the surface of it. A lot of people like to use that as mulch. They'll still use the compost and then they'll use the overs as a mulch, the big chunky overs as mulch too. So if you ever have access to those, I highly recommend it. It's a good mulch. We had, uh, do we have any questions in the old chat? Um, yeah, it was an aspect of being able to mix fecal matter. Someone asks, is it safe to use wild turkey manure? Um, and just wondering if wildlife is different from like domestic chickens. You mean as far as, as far as the manure? You know, it's hard to tell because I mean, of course birds are omnivores. I mean, they're gonna eat bugs and they're gonna eat plants as well. I think it's just a question of, that's a good question. I don't know if I would use wild animal bird, wild animal manure. I might just stick with domesticated. That might be a fun experiment, but then again, it's just about, you know, how much, I mean, let's say how much going to turkey poop, if I'm being honest. You know what I mean? Because it's not like it's, you know, if you're domesticating turkeys, then I would, I would probably use that. I haven't heard anything detrimental about that. Um, but yeah, but if it's something that you keep, but for wild, when I mean, you're gonna be out just collecting tiny, tiny little scraps, and they're like cows where, you know, but you got quantity, you got quantity for cows and horses. Geese? Yeah, geese, I, yeah, I don't wanna use geese. I think they have, I think they got something going on that I might not want to incorporate into that for sure. But I think with a domestic animal, especially if you know 
what they're being fed and stuff, I think you, I think you could be safe. Mm -hmm. Um, so someone is saying volunteer vegetables and their compost bin. Is that a sign of it not getting hot enough? It can be, it, or it can be, or the fact that you, um, that maybe it's not buried, but yeah, I've had stuff like that happen. Tomato plants, especially if it's on, because most bins are going to be relatively exposed on the side. There's going to be some sort of light. So, you know, I've had tomato plants grow out of the side. I've had potatoes. Um, chances are, if you don't get your bin really hot, it's going to be squ free squash plant and free tomato plants all day long in your compost pile, which I have no problem with. Generally, though, it's usually not the same. It's usually like cherry tomatoes, even if you don't put cherry tomatoes in there. Um, and for as far as the squashes are concerned, um, that's a mixed bag, too, just because, you know, Corey and I, we live next door to each other. And this year she grew pumpkins and this year I grew zucchini and we both harvest seeds. But, you know, we got bees going back and forth in our yard. So I was pumpkin. She was zucchini. She plants the seeds. She's pumpkin. Now I'm zucchini or she's zucchini and I'm some sort of weird like hybrid. So you'll get free seeds, but who, who's to say what the actual fruit's going to be? I figure as long as it's not a gourd and it's edible, I say go for it. So yeah, you'll de definitely get a lot of volunteer plants for sure. Um, do you want to answer one more? Yeah, oh, please. Uh, Someone has a sheep and a lot of manure, hay, and bedding to deal with. Uh, can they use this in hot piles and then spread that back into their pastures? Yes and yes. Yeah, sheep, sheep should be good. It's not going to get as hot as chicken, but you definitely can. Yeah, you definitely can incorporate that into your um, into your event for sure. All right. You're welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know, right? I love the the uh, the goats and the in the cow in the background. But hopefully they'll still be there so I get a chance to to meet them. Mm -hmm. All right. So we talked about basic composting, how that makes this great little soil amendment. Now I'm going to pass around worm castings, which is basically code for worm poop. But you know. They always have to have fancy words for stuff like that. Like crickets or frats. That's their, their way to call frats. I have both these bins just because I think it's fun. I keep my worm bin indoors. I have two of them. I keep them indoors. They're right by the front door. So I can pull them out on my front porch when I need to harvest or maintain or, you know, there's any kind of issue. Uh, but it's close enough to my kitchen that I can go ahead and feed it. My boyfriend didn't know. We had a worm bin until he'd been living in my house for four months. And I went to feed them one day and was like, are those worms? Yeah, absolutely, they're worms. They work really, really hard for me, really hard. See how dark and black and rich and crumbly they are? So what I'm talking about, the compost that I passed around earlier, I'm going to treat that more like a soil amendment. Again, that MPK is one to one to one. But for worm castings, I'm gonna treat that more like a fertilizer and it's gonna be a lot higher in nitrogen than anything else. So I'm gonna use that um, to promote um, growth and stems and leaves and branches, stuff like that. So I'm gonna use that primarily to side dress. So use it around existing plants. Um, I'm gonna use that, that's my main use for it for the most part. Again, indoors and outdoors. Um, if it's outdoors, I keep it out of the sun, um, especially if you have a bin that has, uh, maybe has a lid that has holes in it, keep it out of a place where it's going to be too exposed to the rain or too uh, too hot or too cold of temperature. Actually, they do probably do better in cold, believe it or not, than they do in that natural. Um, I said castings, high in nitrogen, treat them like a fertilizer for sure. Sure. Nice thing about a worm bin is I can go on vacation for two weeks and I don't have to worry about feeding. Not that I'm taking two week vacations, but if I wanted to take a two week vacation, I could do it and I would only have to feed my worms at the time. So find yourself a bin. I made my own bin. I have a homemade bin and I have a bin that's, um, that was a present for me. 
but it really all depends. It's all pretty much the same. Shallow, um, sometimes there's bin systems that are stackable. They're called migrating bins with the purpose of making sure that that's gonna be a lot easier to harvest. But either way, you get a fancy bin, you get a non-fancy bin, harvesting is easy no matter what. Even if it's just a question of just sticking your hand in the pile, take the worms and the roly polies out, castings, done, and then use whatever you want to with. Um, if I'm gonna make a homemade bin, I'm, I wanna make sure I want a lid for that. Just so, you know, my worms don't have to be worried about being exposed to the light. And then I'm gonna drill some holes along the sides, not on the bottom. Um, the bottom, the moisture from that can be controlled with the bedding. For bedding, I generally like to use newspaper. Again, when newspaper is hard to find, I like to use cardboard egg cartons or small pieces of cardboard to help kind of soak up the moisture. But they're worms all day, so they actually don't mind it a little bit mucky, just as long as you don't make it so they drown, for sure. Once I get my bin all set up, I know where I'm going to put it. I'm going to live in my living room. I'm going to live in my kitchen. I'm going to live in my garage or my backyard, wherever it's going to be. I'm going to start off with some um, wet paper. So I'm usually I like to shred newspapers and I'm going to wet it. And I'm going to wring it out and it's going to be damp. And I'm just going to layer, unlike basic composting, there's no like browns and greens. There's no 50-50. It's basically just pretty much eyeballing. So I'm going to take the wet paper. I'm going to spread it on the bottom of my bin. You know, it can be kind of clumpy. Um, if you have a migrating bin, because uh, it's all perforated on the bottom, I would start off with, before I put the wet paper, I might put a sheet of cardboard on the bottom because it's going to take a couple of weeks for your worms to get acclimated. And sometimes they get a little bit of, they get kind of out of control. Not out of control. I don't want to say it like that. Um, disoriented, maybe that's the key. So I want to make sure they stay in the tray, in that perforated tray. That cardboard, is gonna keep them there while they get organized. And of course, they're gonna eventually eat it and then it won't really matter whether or not stuff happens to pass through. So wet paper, worms and food. So I'm gonna get a pound of red wigglers. That's the variety that I'm looking for. A worm can eat half its body weight in food every day. So if I get a pound of worms, that really means I can feed my worm bin half a pound of food on the daily, which is nice. Compost. And then when it comes to food, I'm going to incorporate a lot of the things, a lot of the greens that I would normally put in my compost bin, primarily just food scraps. So eggshells, coffee grounds, tea bags, those fruit and vegetable peelings. The exceptions to those rules are I don't incorporate any citrus into my worm bin, nor, and again, because my friends all like to um, breathe through their skin. So I'm not going to use like chili peppers or onions or garlic, anything kind of too aromatic or too spicy or too citrusy. I'm not going to include that, but they get everything else. They get fruit and vegetable cores, strawberry hulls, you know, eggshells, corn cobs, whatever they need to. Give them about a quarter food. I'm going to put some wet paper on top and then I top it with dry paper. And basically any kind of troubleshooting problem that you may have in a worm bin, to be honest, can be solved with dry paper. I got fruit flies, dry paper. <coughs> it's too wet, dry paper. My greens aren't buried in the pile, right on top. So I'm gonna set my bin up. I'm gonna go ahead and put it. Again, when the time comes to feed it, similar to your, your basic bin, I'm going to pull back the paper, any bedding that I might have on the top, put the greens in the middle of the pile, put the browns right back on top of it. And that's pretty much it. There's no aerating, there's no watering, none of that. Takes about six to nine months to start maybe getting a finished product. But when you do, it happens pretty relatively quickly. And you can get a fair amount of castings in about a year. I always recommend to tell everybody that they should... Um, harvest their bin at least once a year. I mean, harvest by empty the whole thing out and start fresh. I usually take those castings and I, I have um, with cats, I have one of those kitty litter, plastic jug kitty litter containers. 
with the kind of the hinge lid. I just put all the castings in there. I leave the lid slightly open. I don't want them to stay too, too wet. They get a little dry on top, but they last, they last a long time. And then I usually feed from that. And then I will rebid, I will restart my bin again with the same situation. And then we'll talk about different types of harvesting. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. When I harvest all the worms and as many of my compost critters I can wrangle up, then yeah, those all get reintroduced right back into the bin. So where they do the where they do the most good. Yeah. Oh no, corn cobs never, they never go away. Oh. Yeah, they never go away. It doesn't matter what bin situation that you're in. Avocado, any kind of pits, avocado skin, and corn cobs. Forever. You'll keep seeing them forever rotate through. And then eventually you're like, ah, you know what? Green card. There we go. <laughs> so good. This is kind of on the side. In industries like feeding cattle, where they use corn, what do they do with the corn cob? Just grind them up? Yeah, the yeah, they'll get grind. Yeah, they, they have these, these definitely these machines that are just grinding up to super, super small, more than I could ever. So, yeah, pits, bones, all kinds of stuff. I mean, all of our meats and stuff that are being incorporated that, that, yeah. All right. Where do you recommend that uh, people get worms? You know, there's a uh, depending on where you, excuse me, where you go. Sometimes people like to check local bait shops. You can buy them online, but I got bitten by that. Um, with the idea being that when you buy worms, you want a good combination of um, baby worms and already mature worms. I found that when I purchased them online, it was all immature. And so for the first two weeks, I constantly, every single day for two weeks, I had what's known as worm run. So when you first get your bin and you first set up your bin, <clears throat> I'm going to feed them. And then I'm just pretty much going to ignore them for like a week because, you know, they don't know that they're sitting in a container in my living room in my house in Martinez. They have no idea. So they might be a little bit unsettled. So worm run can happen in three different types of circumstances. Maybe I put something here in the bin that I don't like. Maybe, a, you know, a rogue lemon or a rogue orange ends up being in my bin. It's too acidic for them. They're going to want to run and they're going to probably come out of their air holes and be all over my wooden floor. It's happened before. Right before it rains, which I can always be an indicator, you take the lid off and they're all on the lid. When the barometric pressure drops, it sends a signal into them Again, they don't realize that they're in my bin in my living room. They think they're in the ground and they, they have to get above ground because rain's coming. So that happens. Also too, when you first get them, sometimes they have a tendency to worm run. Um, the solution is very easily. That's one another reason why I like to keep by the front door or if you have a lamp, I'm just gonna take the lid off and I'm gonna shine bright light on it. And then they're gonna force themselves back down into the pile. With the citrus incident, I'm, of course, I'm just going to remove the offending citrus, probably add some shredded paper on there um, and keep going. So sometimes that happens with the immature ones. Like I said, it happened every day for um, for like two weeks. Um, the Sonoma Valley Worm Farm, I think they're mail order. I think you can go to them. They have specific minimums, I think they do for that. Uh, there's Delta Worms as well. Um, but I know there's a lot of kind of burgeoning worm place, but you're looking for the red wigglers is the variety that you're looking for. So when you do shop for, you do worm shopping, um, that's what you're actually looking for. That's just going in there. No, no what? No mesh. Mesh? The mesh that you have there. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah, no, that doesn't have to. Yeah, because I don't have to worry about making it rodent resistant. Um, again, it might be something that raccoons might be attracted to. So if you do keep it outdoors, you know, try to keep it in, you know, in a place where it's going to be protected and it's not going to be, be able to be open. Kind of stepping on this already. So we talked about them. Feed them often. Bury that bedding, bury the food waste for sure underneath the bedding. We talked about that. The optimum temperature, 59 to 77 degrees, which I think is... I think we went over the top for that um, this week. Um, so yeah, so I probably would have to um, 
for that, if it's too hot, I would say feed it a little bit more, maybe even spritz it with a little bit of water. If it's too cold, increase the amount of bedding because what's gonna happen is it's too cold, they're all gonna clump together right in the middle of the pile and they're gonna wanna hang out and try to keep each other warm. So if you do keep it outdoors or keep it in a cold garage, um, if you know it's gonna be cold, either try to bring it indoors where it's warmer or just increase the amount of bedding that is to kind of help insulate them for sure. All right, I've set up my bin, everything's cool. Now it's time to harvest. This is the fun part. You have options. There's the migration method. Now for this bin, if I have a bin that is a stackable bin, the idea being it's supposed to be for ease of migration. So I may only have like, usually have either like two or three trays one is an active working tray, the one you're actively feeding. On um, the other ones might be empty. On um, one of them, I'll probably keep newspaper or bedding in so that when I go to, <clears throat> excuse me, I go to feed it, I have bedding at the ready. So chances are I'm gonna have empty one. So the for migration method, I'm gonna stop feeding my worms for about two weeks, pull out any of the old food that I'm gonna have, or probably just put it in my compost bin or if I want to save it for the worms, I might put it in the freezer, just put it in the bag in the freezer. And then for the actual fancy migration method ones, I'm going to stop feeding them. I'm going to take my blank tray. I'm going to set up that wet newspaper or wet bedding, food, wet bedding, dry bedding. And I'm gonna sit it right on top of the old one, or the one that's my working bin. <clears throat> Notice no cardboard on that one. Making sure that when the bottom, the top of my one that I'm gonna, they're gonna migrate to, and the one that I'm making sure that they both touch so that this gonna make it easier for them to transfer. So give it a few days, they're gonna migrate from the area where there's no food to the area where there's new food. And of course, there's always gonna be stragglers. So you can just kind of hand pick out. It's a great way to just do your whole bin, but it takes a few days in order to do that. But if I'm looking for castings right now, I'm just gonna go ahead and just rummage around to the bottom of my bin, grab them out, take some newspaper. Take, oh, I found another egg. Take out my worms, take out the roly polies, and any undecomposed food. And then I'm just going to go from there. I'm just going to go ahead and use it. Usually that's the method that I usually choose. <laughs> um, there's the pile method. That's another way of, um, I'm sorry, I skipped that. So that's for if you have a migrating bin. In a bin in this kind of situation, I'm going to take the bin. I'm going to, again, stop feeding them for two weeks. I'm going to take all the materials. I'm going to push everything over to this side, even if it has to be mounted. I'm going to leave this side empty. And then again, I'm going to build this empty side, my wet paper, food, wet paper, dry paper. So as opposed to them crawling vertically, they're going to migrate from this area to this area, leaving virtually this area pretty virtually empty and devoid of worms and roly polies. Again, there's always going to be stragglers. And so then I'm going to go ahead and harvest that. For the pile method, I'm just going to take a tarp. It's going to be on like a sunny or kind of really kind of bright day. I'm going to dump the entire contents of my bin on the tarp. And then I'm just going to make piles, smallish piles. Again, we talked about how they don't like the light and they're going to go chasing down. This is where this is the important part. I'm going to take a pile and I'm going to start scraping off the castings until I see worms. We go to the next pile. The worms are going to work their way down into the pile and attempt to hide from the light. And then I'm just going to keep separating the castings from the worms. And then I'm going to reintroduce the worms back into their bin. And then I'm going to take the castings and set those aside for later use. That's the pile method. That's a quick, relatively quick. It's quicker than the migration method, let's put it that way. Um, or sometimes just dump it and then just sit there with, listen to a podcast and literally just pick worms and roly polies out of the bin. I've done that before as well. Mostly for this one, because it's small, the bigger one. I have to use the pile method because I'd be out there all day long. And then there's the colander method. 
that method is similar to me just reaching my hand into the bin. I'm going to take a colander that I'm never going to use for any other purposes than this. And I would just like to throw those really superly meshy ones under the bus. Those ones are horrible. They're horrible as colanders in general because they're horrible to clean. But they're perfect for diluting worm casting. Take a bucket, take a handful of the casting, store that in the colander, and then I'm going to go ahead and just rinse it. The worms and the roly polies are just going to be there, any kind of little on stuff. Dump it right back into the bin. Dilute that to the color of weak tea. And then I'm going to use that to water. That's how I like to side dress my plants. I'm going to use that to water my plants. That way, because it is very high in nitrogen, it's very more like a fertilizer. I don't want to overuse it. So, but if I dilute it, I can utilize it and not really have to worry about that I'm overusing it. If I dilute it to the color of weak tea. If I do want to mix it with soil, no more than 20% castings to 80% soil. That's how potent they can really be. If you use it too much, you could actually kill your plants. But if you use it correctly, it's amazing. It really is amazing. I have a girlfriend, she brought back a cutting from her grandmother's plants. Her grandmother's no longer with us. And I just saw the plant the other day. It was started out with this little scraggly one leaf thing. Now it's huge and tall. And because I told her, worm castings, worm castings. I actually have worm castings to get out today so you to take home. I can talk about how great worm castings are all day, but proof is in the pudding. So if you take them home and you try them at home, then you're like, well, maybe she's onto this one. Then uh, any questions? That is it for me. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're not the best. What what's what are you adding to the bin that that usually it's if it's just like food scraps and stuff, um, it sh there should be no maggots. Hmm. Sometimes if there's like you incorporating like, I like some people like you know salad. You know what I mean? I have excess salad. Maybe it was stressed. Maybe it had a little bit of cheese. Maybe it had something that was. Hmm. 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 That's a good question. Yeah, I mean, that's entirely possible that you that that they're just continuing their cycle in the bin. I would pick them out. I mean, they're just mostly just gross, which is enough for me. <laughs> I'm all, I can handle a lot of stuff, but dry maggots, that's where I, you know, dirty diapers, manure, <laughs> cool. Maggots is where I usually pretty much draw the line. I mean, if that's not a problem for you and if, it, if the populations don't get out of control, um, I think that's entirely up to you as a composter. I mean, as a composter, I'm giving you, you know, basic recipes. And some people like to incorporate things that I normally wouldn't, I wouldn't normally put in. For me, I like to experiment with things that are supposedly compostable. That's my favorite thing to do, um, is to, you know, compostable silverware, compostable cups, compostable hotel key. They're, they're not, <laughs> they're not. I try them in my worm bin, I try them in my compost bin, and they look exactly the same, just a little dusky, so. Don't believe the hype, unless it's paper, which is another great experiment. Take a coffee cup, just a regular, like, you know, Pete's cup or whatever, and put that in. It has plastic lining. The worms eat all the cardboard, but leave the plastic lining completely intact, like completely untouched. It's very fascinating. You have, was there any questions in the chat? There is a few, yeah. Sure. Uh, we have a question. Uh, uh, we'll do this one. Did you mention whether or how to make, I don't, these are a little interesting questions. Okay. Uh, how to make the compost all organic? It's just like what you put in. Yeah, it's basically what you put in. So if, if basically everything is, you put in is organic in nature, you know, then technically it would be organic, but that's kind of a hard thing to control because you can't control the wood fiber or the leaves or anything like that. Again, 
that also lends itself to closing the loop in your property. So if you know that your trees haven't been like, you know, done in with weird chemicals and, you know, maybe you've mulched your own trees and you know what I mean? It all really all depends on what's kind of going on in your property. But the idea being that if you're incorporating conventional things into it, um, then it, I guess technically, but there's a lot of things that could be used for organic use. Mm -hmm. That's usually with, that's usually stuff that you purchase. Um, and there's also another question is, uh, will we cover, uh, go over cover crops or chop and drop mulching? Um, I can only imagine that is like you chop it and then, or you like, as you're pruning and then you let it kind of decompose on the ground. Yeah, you can definitely use that. I mean, just, you know, stems, flower stems. A lot of people just like to do that with cover crops like baba beans or any kind of cover crop that you have to chop, you know, kind of in mid flower. A lot of people like to use that. My only recommendation is if you're doing anything that's has a legume, just making sure that you do chop it um, and don't pull the roots out. because so that's where all the nitrogen is, is on the root hairs on that for sure. Please feel free to um, ask any more questions if you have any answers. Yeah, you had a question. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's perfectly fine. They'll love it. They'll just be there to eat their organic material. Yeah. They, yeah, they're not going to hurt their, you know, and to help aerate the soil. And then, you know, not to be gross, but they, you know, they're going to eat the material and then it's going to pass through their system and they're going to leave these casting spines. So no matter where they've been, there's all this great soil amendment that's being, you know, interjected into your soil, most likely at the base of your plants, which is perfect. And they help kind of help break up the soil, especially if you're dealing with clay. Yeah, I was going to say, where I live, it was heavy clay. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard for them when there's no. Yeah. Yeah, that means that you're adding organic material to the soil. That's always a good indication. If you're not really sure what your, your soil situation is, you dig a hole and look for worms or dig a hole and pour water into it. If it drains super fast, you've got sandy soil, you pour water in, you come back a day later and there's still water in there, then most likely you have a place, most likely. And it's always a lot easier to garden when you know what kind of soil that you're working with. You know, if I have sandy soil, I'm gonna have to amend and water a lot more often than with clay soil. With clay soil, I have to make sure that the roots can penetrate down into the soil. So I'm gonna add organic material. I'm going to use cover crops. I'm going to plant perennials that are going to help kind of loosen the soil and, and stuff like that in order to kind of really do a good job of, you know, getting down through there. Because a lot of it's like hard fat clay. Like right now, the clay is just pulled back. I have a, an area and a client's yard where it's, there's no mulch, but there's like these chasms, you know, where the, the clay just shrinks back and leaves a lot of holes you know, until, until we end up having the rainy season just because it just withdraws. But if I'm being totally honest, I would rather deal with clay soil than with sandy soil. And that's the reason why I, sandy soil, am growing everything in containers because mm -hmm. I just can't. Just can't. Mm -hmm. There's not enough time in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, generally, um, I don't like to put a lot of like too many greens in here because the idea being is I'm trying not to mimic a basic bin. A lot of people could say that they would say sometimes I like to add leaves, but I don't want the temperatures to get hot in here. I need it to stay kind of cold compost at all times. So I basically just stick to food scraps and then the bedding only because I don't want temperatures to get high up in this bin. So that, that's going to really, again, they really don't have a place to run. And so the hot temperatures could potentially kill my friends. Um, the most common thing that you may normally see in a worm bin when we're talking about troubleshooting is there might be ants. They like to show up again. They're mostly there for free food and to, you know, bite you on the arm when you put your hand in the bin. In a bin like this, if I had a big ant problem, I might take Vaseline and just put it along the edge of it. If you have like a migrating bin that has legs, I might take like shallow cans like cat food cans or tuna fish cans or something 
I will put the legs in there, fill them with water and maybe put a little bit of vegetable oil in it. Just basically just kind of creating a barrier so they don't get in. Um, for also for worm bins, sometimes um, you might get like mites, they're little kind of spidery things. They come usually like brown in color um, or they also come in red in color. Usually the red ones, they can, if they get to large populations, they can actually eat your worms. So if you find and usually see them either um, conglomerating on the lid or right there on the top of the bin. If that problem becomes too problematic, I'll just take a piece of bread, like stale, you know, old piece of bread. I'll put a piece of bread in the bin, put the lid on. They're all attracted to it. And then once it looks like there's a lot of them, I'll take that, put mine my green cart, and then I'll put another thing in there and try to reduce the population as much as possible. The brown ones, not so much, and you can kind of tell, but the red ones, they look very like fire truck, fire truck engine kind of red, that blue red kind of color. Um, you may see those in your bin too. They can be problematic, but they're very easily corrected. So a piece of bread, and then they're just going to want to jump on that. And you just get the populations down. Yeah, no, please. I love questions. What about those little white worms? The little pot worms? Those are perfect. Those totally hang out. Those are acceptable. You'll see, you come to, and I would invite you to come and see my bin. There's probably going to be white worms. There's going to be springtails, millipedes. Sometimes, depending on if your bin's indoors or outdoors, you'll see things like slugs and snails, or spiders, or centipedes, all different types of things you may see in your bin, whether it be a basic bin or your worm bin. Just as long as it's, you know, not furry tailed and, you know, <laughs> those things you definitely don't want to see in your bin, but everything else is still pretty good or neutral, let's put it that way, or neutral. Any other questions? Well, great. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the great questions. I have those resources. I'm here available to ask for questions. Again, if you're here and you're joining us on Zoom, um, I will send a copy of the PowerPoint presentation um, as well as the handouts that I passed out today. Um, all my contact information is on the handout. So if you have any questions about composting in general or gardening, um, please feel free to reach out. I teach now we're doing a lot more in-person stuff. So please feel free to um, you can check me out on Instagram or on Facebook. I usually like to post a lot of my, um, my workshops there, whether they be via Zoom or via in-person. Um, so please check me out and happy composting, everyone. Thank you so much, Marty. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And then again, um, I have castings. So if you'd like to take them home and try, um, I definitely, I definitely encourage you to do that. Thank you, everyone. You'll be getting a recording of this, and we just appreciate you so much for testing out our first hybrid event. We really do appreciate it. Thank you so much.